Welcome, everyone. This is a conversation uh, with Ryan Barton, who generously accepted this invitation. I came across Ryan's work through John Verbeke. Uh, Ryan appeared on John's channel a few months back, where he discussed uh, business and meaning. And it's interesting to me because, as you guys know, I've been uh, thinking about work these days. This is uh, one of uh, a series of discussions I've been having around this subject. So uh, now I'm going to let Ryan introduce himself and tell us what brought him to John's channel to discuss work and meaning. Yeah, thanks, JP. I feel like that what brought me to John's channel, it's like how long of my entire life, right? How long of the journey do you want? Uh, but yeah, I, so I live in New Hampshire with my family. And um, today, my time is pretty split between being CEO of the IT services company that I founded uh, 19 years ago now. It's called Mainstay Technologies. And we service clients' IT departments. So it's a service um, business in the tech space. And then also um, working for John in and at the Verveke Foundation, helping to scale and bring organizational quality to the, the solutions for the meaning crisis. What brought me to John... Um, I mean, you know, the sort of short answer is I, he was on Jordan Peterson and I was like, there mm -hmm. is something here. Like, what is this? I need more. And Jordan, stop interrupting him. Like, I need all the answers to all of these <laughs> questions. I don't know if you remember that conversation. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, that was, yeah. That, that was a strange one. Yeah, yeah I was so frustrated because like every answer John started to give was so good. And then um, that led me to awakening from the meaning crisis. And, you know, that came at a time in my life where, you know, some years before I had entered therapy after realizing that. Like my emotional reality was not just unique. It was not just innate to Ryan Barton. It was actually formed and that there are things like attachments and, you know, latent memory and emotional patterns that explained my experience. And then therapy was transformative for me. I mean, I had really powerful experiences and an embodied sense of the truth and like, oh, like this is what my body's been saying and my mind's saying something else. And when you get those to hook up, you know, there's such a powerful life that comes in that. But I was like, I, I need more than therapy. Like I can't keep circling trauma to keep getting more life. And so, you know, and I'd done kind of the mindfulness meditation, you know, the like light little app, 10 minutes and not really understood it. And I'd done some different yoga, but not hooked them up. And so then when I found John's work, it was like, ha, ha, ha you know, like here's all of the answers to the questions that I've been wrestling with and all the theological and philosophical wrestling I'd been doing. And I, um, you know, really, really find his arguments compelling on ecologies of practices. And it's it's interesting on the business side because I've been wrestling for decades with what is a virtuous model of capitalism and business and how can I be a virtuous entrepreneur? And John's work helped me to connect some of that as well. I think the Neil Platonic framework really sort of clicked a few things for me of, of how this can work today. Could you give us uh, maybe some examples of how you saw the Neoplatonic framework making things click? Yeah, so, you know, I think that, um, I think that when you start thinking about a hierarchy, right, a metaphysical hierarchy and a mm -hmm. path of transcendence along in that, that we are being drawn in a transcendent way, mm -hmm. that it starts to help, it helped me to really question the hierarchy of value that is assumed and just built into the worldview in business. And so, you know, there is this deep worldview in business that says, getting rich is what this is about. And there's a real compelling stories in that. Things like, if you can get enough capital, you can not have to work ever again. If you can get enough money, you get financial freedom. And like, those are the goals. If you can become powerful, you become a Titan, you can have a job that you love. There's all these different narratives that we find compelling that are ultimately attached, attached to some metaphysical value that someone says is the ultimate value. And when you start to say very clearly like, oh, the true, the good, and the beautiful, let's just put the transcendentals up and say, the true, the good, and the beautiful is what is not only of ultimate value, but is of in infinite unfolding, that I can get more and more access to these. I can un cause more and more of them to come into being here, and I can be more and more formed by them and conformed to them in my being, then how does then the question immediately becomes how does everything else fall into place? How does everything else come into that hierarchy? And it really strikes me like, oh, this is maybe a little bit of what Christ is saying: if you can't serve two masters, right? Like mm -hmm. who's like and like in a very applied way. I mean, I've known that verse my whole life, but like, how do you apply that inside a business when you have to meet a certain bottom line requirement and drive a profit and loss and grow your career? Like, how does that really resonate and come into your body? 
-hmm. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And I wonder how you've been doing this as a CEO, because uh, mainly like in the discussions I've been having so far on my channel, I've been speaking about this, the path for an individual, really. Like, mm -hmm. um, and the, the way I add the tendency to frame it was that it's a, you start by just doing your own work. And as you do this, you can acquire skills that you can transfer to higher levels. So that at some point you start to manage a group of people, let's say, and you can make yep. use of the skills that you learned at the lower scale, but now they're tested at a higher scale. So you learn to develop virtues more. Like some of your faults will become more obvious when you start mm -hmm. to see like how your personality affects others around you. Um, and you can do this by becoming, let's say, a better and better manager. And over time, you can, let's say, lead greater groups uh, or groups that do more difficult things. And like naturally, the sort of trajectory that I saw was that eventually I would um, like probably stop doing it in a business context and maybe switch to doing it more in a church kind of context. Um, but Let's see if you if you've been leading an organization for a long time, and I don't know like if you you plan on doing that for still mm -hmm. a long time. Like I wonder how you frame it for yourself, how you try to yeah really cultivate meaning in that environment and help others around you do so. And that's so good. And I know I'm struck by so much through that. One just of a, a, a counter story mm -hmm. of a friend of a friend who quit being a pastor to go be a controller in the finance department because mm -hmm. he was like, I can have more influence on people's mm -hmm. lives and I can shape them more powerfully here than I can from a pulpit, which there's a lot to be said for that. And so I mm -hmm. find that business really has an impact. And I love your, hey, grow in virtue, grow in skill, grow in the right ordering of your own priorities, and then your mm -hmm. ability to impact others with that, and then look to continue that trajectory. And it's interesting that you called out sort of this, like at some point, you need to go to clearer air is almost how I'm hearing you, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. you need to sort of exit the, 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 the structure that you're growing in within capitalism. And I think that the joy as an entrepreneur is that like, I get to create that environment to a large degree. Now I'm obviously within the capitalist environment. I mean, I can't, yeah. there's a lot of things that we still have to work within and, and, and a lot of problems within the capitalist structure, but what your, your um, thought process there, which I really like is about growing in scope. And so mm -hmm. for me, I just get a scope over the whole company with that environment. And my goal yeah. is that everyone who's working is actually working on something meaningful that they're well suited for that is connected to bringing about the good in the world, like true goodness that we serve our clients, we serve the market, bringing in true goodness. And we don't do something that's profitable, but not good. And yep. it's, that's good, maybe like profitable, but not beautiful. Like, no, it must be true and good and beautiful. We do every marketing piece, everything we do must serve in that way. And let's all put our attention to that. And then let's create an environment where we're mentoring each other. We're calling giftings out of each other. We're inviting into the path of wisdom. And then the beauty of it, JP, is that when we, you know, my experience working in churches and ministries and mm -hmm. volunteering has been often that that gets divorced from reality very easily because mm -hmm. you have people giving you money and you can kind of yeah. do whatever you want and you say things as long as people are coming. Yeah. But in business, you get such feedback. Like you are right up against reality. Like you are going to, you don't make yeah. money. You are going to very bad place very quickly. Or if people quit, like you get feedback, like someone doesn't yeah. want to work with you. That's big feedback. So there's a connection to reality that I think is actually necessary in the cultivation of wisdom. Mm -hmm. That like as much as for myself, I would love to not have to carry the weight of leading a business. I don't think I will become the person I can become if I have if I keep carrying that weight because of that connection to reality. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. I, I fully agree with this. In fact, when I was finishing up my master's a few years ago, I was really thinking about doing a PhD on the same kinds of subjects. And oh, interesting. the biggest reason why I decided not to do it and rather to start working. In fact, I got so worried about this that I even like finished my master's part-time as I started working full-time um, was I was exactly worried about the lack of feedback that you're talking mm -hmm. about right now. Like I could see, especially it's probably worse here in Quebec because higher education is basically free. Um, like everyone gets um, some uh, like government help or even just small uh, money from the school that is going to be plenty to pay like the fees. So like it's basically free for, for everyone. And what that does is um, like 
you can be very isolated uh, from material constraints as a graduate student here. So I saw many people around me who were very disconnected from concrete reality and who could fly off into all kinds of different directions. It was like almost caricatural. So like I, I could see different grad students around me who like each had their own like idiosyncratic view of the world. And you could see it like yeah. even visually, like people behave like super differently and they each like got into their own little world. And I think a lot of this was just because they were not like subject to real constraints in the real world. And like they couldn't test their ideas and get immediate feedback. And I saw that I could get this much better if I just like started working concretely in the real world. Um, wow. And similarly, at some point I was also um, thinking about um, the priesthood or becoming a monk. Uh, and like, for me, I saw that I had to do things much more gradually than this. Like I, I felt mm -hmm. like if I try to jump right away to this level of reality, I'm not ready yet. Like I need to build up competence at lower layers. Um, and then maybe later I can play more of a leadership role or a more spiritual role somewhere. But I, I could feel that I needed to get like years of concrete feedback through the layers of the hierarchy that I mentioned earlier. So I, I fully agree with, with all of this. Um, and I have a follow-up on something else that you said, but if you have a follow-up on what I just said, then... Yeah, ahead. if I could just say first, I mean, I'm just struck by how perspicacious you were, were at that stage of life. I mean, what a gift to have that perspective and that kind of insight. And then your courage to actually say, like, I'm going to seek a deep contact with reality, even when it's hard. Because, man, I don't know about you, but like the desire to flee the hard stuff of reality and create a little world for myself is so strong in me that I'm so grateful for the constraints and for the forced grind and connection that like, had I gone to be a monk or a pastor or something early, like I would not, I mean, I've obviously they have and to anyone who's like listening who's a priest or monk, I don't mean any disrespect in that. And like, I know that has its own hardship and it's and reality will have its way. Right. But there is something beautiful about work and there is something that is um, sacred about work. There is something that's deeply meaningful about using your hands and your mind to bring think to work with others to bring about more goodness in the world and the, and the direct feedback of that that i think is is absolutely critical and gets lost in our story of capitalism and of work today yeah 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 and i mean yeah to to, to add to what you just said about let's say the caveat about priests and monks i think there really are people who are like either say called to do this for special reasons yes. like there's some people who like we'll just jump through a whole bunch of layers all at once and they will be fine. For many people, it won't be, but there are plenty of people for whom it will be. And also I think there's people who were able to ascend all of those layers like in their family, essentially. Like I think mm. for, for many people, if um, like a, a classic story that I've seen fairly often is uh, sometimes uh, like in, at least for, from the, the church I know, the Catholic church, like it will often happen. Let's say that uh, if a, a, a couple very pious and they really love one another obviously they're very happy like it's not rare that all of the children will become like monks or nuns or mm. priests and that kind of stuff so mm. uh, like this this will happen and i think it's largely because like if if your parents have ascended like so many of those layers well then as you get brought up by them you sort of absorb all of this like mm -hmm. in accelerated form and i mean it, you, you also like spend years in the seminary or like discerning your monastic vacation or whatever, but but still, like I think it's it's possible if you do like your job really well as a parent, then your children can like go through the, the layers much faster. So I think that's another reason why some people are called to this well. Well, I appreciate you explicating that, and I think that's well said and gives me great hope as a parent. Right, the more <laughs> we can save our children and uh, you know move them through these layers, the the better. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I think I, I mean a good example I think is a. Mary and Joseph were like completely anonymous. Like they, they had no direct influence on anything, but like their child obviously had a huge influence on history until this day. Yes. Um, and yeah, to, to come back to another thing that you said, I, I found it super interesting when you said that you tried to encourage the pursuit of the transcendentals in your business. And I, I wonder how employees react to this. Like, do they uh, sort of naturally like find work more compelling because of this? Because I... And also, like, does this allow you to make some trade-offs that other companies couldn't make? Because um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that sometimes if you go for the, the true, the good, and the beautiful, there are some things that other companies may be willing to do that you won't be willing to do. Right. So, like, this can put you at a disadvantage, like, in that sense. But in another way, if 
your uh, employees and maybe customers find value in what you're doing, even if it's not as, let's say, economically expedient, then you can still eventually like win as a as a company. Is that has that yes. been something that has happened? Yes, and and that's well said. And I think what's tricky in this is that it's so easy to talk about these things and then immediately go to how it's good for business, which is a subtle way of saying the master we're really serving is the long-term shareholder value of the business, right? And if you mm -hmm. look, there's sort of a trick. You can look at all the sort of progressive biz conscious capitalism kind of business books and B Corp and, and like, look, they're good things. And I pre I've learned so much from them and from those movements and I'm not um, meaning in any way to denigrate them, but but I have a critique that typically the appeal is still to long long term shareholder value. Like like ultimately, there's still everything that's true, good, and beautiful must serve this other thing, and that's really what's in charge. And so there is one side of this where we like to point at things where we are making sacrifices, where the business could be more financially successful if we didn't take these steps, and if we don't have a list of things, if I can't quickly identify areas where we are sacrificing for virtue, then I'm not really sure that we're actually pursuing virtue. And on mm -hmm. the other hand, authentically pursuing virtue as a team is incredibly attractive. And like we have these unbelievable leaders and team members who who want to work, who see our job ads and they're like, so, like this is what I've been looking for and I didn't have the language for. And then they come and they stay for years and decades because they get to be treated like people in pursuit of other people and they their emotions are welcomed and their creativity and there's a place of vulnerability. No one's yelling and there's no like other shoe gonna drop. And, and we get to create this amazing team on a mission of genuinely trying to do good. That's incredibly compelling to work for. And then for clients, like, we're service business, we're their IT department, right? So mm -hmm. do you want to work in an IT department where everybody hates their job, where people are motivated and happy and like like it it changes their organizations? And mm -hmm. so it really works with our economic model. Like we can be very successful in doing this at the same time. But I have to hold those tensions, right? Where like, I believe that authentic marketing is the best way to do it because people's BS radar is getting more and more finely honed. And like, mm -hmm. like just tell the truth and like, re like create communication that resonates and tells the truth and moves somebody with marketing. And yet we can then start to use that as a tactic and like, oh man, that's such a balance to try to negotiate that. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. ten does that tension makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think so. It, it, it's interesting too, because I haven't, taken the time to think about this super, super carefully, but um, I've heard at least Jonathan say that uh, with the idea of sacrifice, there's like an, an immediate sacrifice that you make for something. You, let's say you sacrifice your best for something higher, but then the surprise that comes is that you get back what you sacrificed and even more. So mm. there's often this pattern in the Bible where people will like sacrifice the best of their flock or even their son. And eventually what you get back is not only the best that you just sacrificed, but you get like much more than that. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because then like you can sort of do the analogous thing here for a business saying that, uh, okay, well, if you're willing to sacrifice profits uh, to cultivate the transcendentals, then you're going to get even more profits eventually. But if you like, in that equation, if you focus on the last part where you finish with more profits, if you just like focus on that part and you forget the transcendentals, then you're gonna get none of it. Like if you if you sacrifice something and uh, knowing that you will get it back and more, and like focusing on that part, it doesn't seem like it's gonna work. Uh, I'm not totally sure. I haven't thought through all of it, but I find it interesting because I do suspect that eventually, like probably businesses that cultivate the transcendentals will will do better. But I mm -hmm. do see also this risk that you're just saying. Like if you just focus on the last part, you can sort of go back yes. to where you started from. Yes, yes. And and money is a sneaky little thing. I mean, money has a way of just kind of getting at your soul in ways that you least expect. And all of a sudden, the power, the status, the esteem, I mean, like all of the four substitutes for God is found in capitalism, yeah. right? I mean, like you realize that like, whoa, I can get power, money, pleasure, esteem all out of my work with this, like all oh, that pulls. And so I really like that model that you're using of like, yeah, you sacrifice, you get more, but you have to be doing that in a mode where you're continually focused on something of infinite value so that you keep sacrificing that of finite value 
in that pursuit? And then how do you surround yourself with a community with, and how do you engage in wisdom practices and engage deeply with the ancient text and really work to stay in the being mode connected to the infinite so that everything else is in the having mode and is a finite resource in that pursuit. And mm -hmm. so I think I think the practical ways of doing that is what I find fascinating. But does that I mean I, I think we're tracking here on the same thing? Yeah. yeah, that's good. That's good. And I want to get exactly to what you just brought up, which is the practical ways of doing this. Because I'm curious to know how you do it in a business context. Like I'm familiar with the way that John explains individual practices to develop the different virtues. Uh, I'm familiar with the Christian practices. Um, I'm even familiar with the group practices in Christianity, but I don't I don't know like concretely how you how you're doing this in the business context. So I'm really curious to 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 see what you're doing. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm excited. So, yeah, and I'm really excited for your voice in this. Like I'm 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 thirsty for your your insights and <laughs> in, in your voice in this because man, it's a uh, it's something that I. I never want to feel like I've figured out like, oh, this is, this scares me. Like the more success quote unquote that I have, like the more scared I am of like, man, I want to steward that well. Like, man, mm -hmm. I want to, um, I want to be worthy of that. Like I would love to be worthy of more scope in the world, but to mm -hmm. actually be, be so virtuous in that. And so mm -hmm. anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm eager for your voice in this. So I'm going to answer this sort of in a descending hierarchy way. Mm -hmm. The first thing that comes to that I would say is that the leaders and the people of power in the business need to have a personal center of focus in their lives that is not the business. And so there is a place of wisdom cultivation, of character formation that is deeper and more compelling and their commitment to it is much greater than their commitment to their capitalist pursuits. And mm -hmm. so like in the church that you are first a Catholic and secondly a business leader, right? Like mm -hmm. that you are first committed to the faith forming that, that your vision of Christ and the kingdom come is so much more compelling. And then that you are radically committed to those practices. That I think comes first for all of the leaders. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it can be very different practices, but they all have to be 100%. pursuing something out there. Okay. Especially in a business where like all the leaders, like this looks different in everybody's lives. Like yeah. you, you want yeah. all kinds of diversity of backgrounds yeah. and faith. And so for me, that might look like meditation and circling. And for you, that might look like mass and, you know, Bible study and prayer. And for someone else, it looks like, you know, felt felt in Christ and, you know, whatever, like we, there are so many ways to do this, but that's why I love the language of the transcendentals is that they are mm -hmm. universally appealing. It's like, no, if you work at mainstay, our first core value is integrity above all else. Like if you don't honor the true, the good and the beautiful, that doesn't matter to you. This is probably not the best home. And that we can recruit for and we can anchor in. And so I look to see like, how can I, especially as the founder and majority owner of the business, like stay anchored and rooted and that my wisdom cultivation is separate over here. And I think all business leaders, I want to invite them to like, no, you need a community and a set of practices and a formation that's outside of the business that then you mm -hmm. draw in, right? Yeah. So that's first. The second is, if you have a good company, the question I want to ask is what's the strategy on capital, the ownership strategy, because the owners have all the power and all the money, right? Like it's a double whammy. And so mm -hmm. whoever the shareholders are and whatever the capital strategy is makes the difference because that's actually what you're optimizing for long-term. What those shareholders really value will come out over enough time. And you see this again and again in business where there'll be a great company and it seems wonderful and people have meaningful jobs and they're treated well and they're growing. And then what happens? Oh, it's sold to private equity. Oh, it's sold to some big public company and everything changes and falls apart and everything meaningful just disappears. Mm -hmm. And so you can have windows of time that are really good and meaningful in business history, but the capital strategy is what really matters. Mm -hmm. And I will say the best book that was the most the most helpful thing I've ever read, I've read a lot in capitalism trying to understand this, was Rerum Navarum. So Pope Leo the oh. 13th, um, back in the 1890s, his encyclical, Rerum Navarum is awesome. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah, it's slightly. But, I didn't read all of it, but now you make me want to do so. Yeah, it's great because, you know, it was at this time of the Industrial Revolution and like the capital versus labor. And, you know, the Pope spoke into that with this beautiful, like, what's the purpose of all of this? And like capital is itself a tool for people and let's not put capital above people. And so how do we use this mechanism? And then, oh, by the way, power corrupts. So let's use subsidiarity. Like we need to push things down. So the whole distributism movement was birthed out of that with Chesterton mm -hmm. and Belloc and the economic systems, which today have birthed a lot of the employee owned companies, which says, how do we long-term push 
ownership and capital rewards down. And I'll tell you, if there's one change I can make in our capitalist system, if it could just be that the rewards of capital flowed more down than they do up, that would change our system overnight. And it would put rewards with the people who are who are actually have control and are actually deeply engaged in it instead of these backroom people who get more and more divorced. The richer you are, the more divorced you are from reality and from like the reality on the ground and from the work itself. So the mm -hmm. capital strategy is incredibly critical. And how do you like do this concretely? Uh... Great. So for for it's a, for us, it's a combination of things. Number one is we have a stated goal to be a hundred year company. Okay. This is not about mm -hmm. like how do we build something that's long term, that's creating good in our community, and providing meaningful jobs, and helping people to grow. And we do it for the long haul. And yeah. what that helps me anchor in is that the business is not an asset on my balance sheet to be exploited and used for mm -hmm. my own purposes. You know, we have if you think of like. Eric Fromm wrote, you know, the having mode and the being mode, right? Yeah. It, the, the, that distinction is really helpful, right? That we have a mode where we need to get and consume and manipulate things. And then we have a mode of being and becoming. Yeah. And we need to separate those, I believe, in capital where like my money, I get to use and exploit and leverage however I see fit. But when you have a business, you actually have commitments to people. You have mm -hmm. jobs, you have... You, you have made career and client commitments that I believe is actually needs to be rooted in the being mode with, if we use Martin Buber's language, an I thou relationship to those things versus an I it relationship to that, which is mechanical. And that the business itself is something where the money is something that I can own, but the business is something that I steward rather than own because, because it's not actually, there's something deeply philosophically wrong with the idea that I can get a hire a bunch of people, make career promises, and then leverage those promises to people that are based on a relationship in in commitments into something that's just exploited for myself that re, that results in higher goods. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, but in the end, who owns the the company? Mainstay? Your, well, or, or, like, in general, or in like, general. Yeah, in general, yeah. like in that in that scheme. Like who owns yeah. the company? So the idea is that there's a number of ways, but it's anyone who can steward the business in a way that doesn't mess up the mechanics and the goodness that the business is about. So you could have you can have external shareholders in business that's set up like this. They just don't get the power, right? Like they don't have the okay. voting power. They don't have the ability to come in and completely change the goals of the business. It's like, hey, here's the commitment and we got to honor and steward that. And there's different ways to get return on that capital. Mm -hmm. Or like for us, the commitment we've made at least is that the only shareholders are people who work within the business. If you don't work in the business anymore, you're not a shareholder because we need embodied decision-making. When you make decisions about a stock, for instance, Mm -hmm. All you're doing is saying, oh, this stock's going down. I want to buy one that's going up. And it's just a mechanical transaction. Yeah. But when you make decisions about leading people in a business, I mean, you're a manager, you know, you're actually using your whole embodied cognition, your emotions, your sense, your values to make a decision where money is one part of the equation of the decision that you make. And I mm -hmm. believe that the owners who have control in a business need to be in the way that they are in there with an embodied decision making. And that's so much of the safety of a business long term mm -hmm. yeah that, yeah good that, that makes a lot of sense yeah so so you have like first layer everyone must be cultivating the virtues like with their own practices outside of work something that they see as more important than work then second the capital must be owned i don't know how to summarize this one so capital must be owned in a way that will not distort the 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 goal of the company itself yes beautifully said and then um, are there lower layers too? Yeah. So then what I would say then next is like the business itself must be doing something that is good in the world, right? So what you're actually producing should be of genuine value and mm -hmm. that what we, the money that we make should be a signifier of the value that we are bringing into the world through serving people with meaningful goods and services, not by tricking them into drinking sugar water that's terrible yeah. for them and giving them diabetes. Like, I'm not sure how ethical a lot of the businesses are actually that we, you know, can easily own stocks in or, or, or hold up as, as, um, you know, sort of yeah. examples in the capitalist world. And so like the business must itself then be serving people in a way that it's doing something good with beauty 
in truth, that we are communicating in truth and that the business model, the products and services are done that way. And that we have anchors and checks as we're building and iterating those over time to actually put metrics around that, to actually like honor that, to actually check for that. All right, and then we get to the team. And so then anyone who's working in that business should have a job that actually is designed for human. That mm -hmm. I propose that like a job that is net bad for someone should either not exist or should be very short term. Like if it's bad for your cognitive development and for your, it's going to shape you poorly. Yeah. That's fine if we recognize it and it's for short term and then we're going to get you, move you and train you into something else. But if it's actually forming and shaping you poorly, mm -hmm. that's that's not a good thing. And so yeah. let's actually jo design jobs that afford flow, that afford for growth, that is genuinely meaningful, that people can feel the connection to the meaning and that they are treated as humans and then that they're invited onto a path of wisdom. So there's this interesting balance where, um, you know, look at work, you can be fired. You can be fired at mainstay. Like we were, it's a job, you have to perform in certain ways, but we can do that in a way that has great kindness, great candor, great care for the individual. And then ultimately invite to a, a growth of transcendence through that of saying, look, your work is, can be an integral part of your growth. Like, I don't know about your experience, but when I became a manager, I got wiser in other areas of my life as well. Like I got greater scope to be able to handle other challenges. Buying a house wasn't as big of a deal and solving or serving on a nonprofit board. Like I grew in perspective and um, in relationship and scope in other areas as well. And growth in career should do that when it's done healthfully. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I saw the same thing. Like if, um, you can see it in all jobs like whatever you do in your job will use the same kinds of mechanisms that you use to do other stuff um i talked uh, about this with with jonathan um in a podcast episode that i translated into english and i know that you read it so i won't go through all of the details but there are some very uh, fundamental patterns that we can see when we study symbolism let's say left hand right hand uh heaven earth the active the contemplative there's all these mm -hmm. basic patterns that uh, are so fundamental that we use them when we do anything. And then that means that we can see them pop up when we do different kinds of work. And when we fail, typically we can diagnose this as some failure using this basic symbolic scheme. So maybe I was too right-handed being too rigid, or maybe I was too mm -hmm. left-handed, too soft. Maybe maybe I was looking at, at it from the wrong layer of reality. Maybe I was too up in the heavens, or maybe I was too low on the earth. Maybe I was... Um, too contemplative and not trying things enough. Maybe I was too active and not taking enough time to reflect and make a longer term plan. So think you can do this uh, in like at, at any any job. Um, obviously, it will appear more. I think in jobs that uh, give you let's say quicker feedback, more honest feedback. Jobs where, uh, as you said, when you get to manage people, I think it gets more obvious to see those patterns. You're more likely to be surprised by people and by the impact that you have on them. Um, but yeah, I definitely uh, agree with this. Um, okay. Yeah, I really like I really like how you describe that in terms of patterns and the universality of that. I think what what I spend a lot of time thinking about is how the environment around us shapes the patterns that we will embody and that are that we are within, and that if we had a perfectly just and virtuous business it would be cultivating patterns within people that would be most effective for growing virtue for all areas of their life, right? Like it would be most deeply connected to reality, to what is true. And it would be in the most honoring way, calling people into a deeper connection of reality and into their greater potential. It would be actualizing their potential in the greatest and highest way. That would be the ultimate just business. But ultimately that would require a just capitalism, a just capital structure with the business, a just business, a just leadership team, a just model, a just manager, a just job, right? And it's hard to do that. And so some people, we are all shaped by the environment that we're in. And so the patterns that are around us, if we don't name them carefully and explicate them, then we end up being shaped in ways unintentionally. And that's the, that's the thing that pushes me at Mainstay is like, what are the patterns that we are calling forth into our team and into the company that ultimately end up being called culture, quote unquote, but how does this come together? And if someone is working, let's just say that you are in a sales job in a very bottom line driven, quota driven organization, 
and everyone around you is only cares about getting the sale done, not how you do it. Well, you will end up naturally embodying a pattern that values the tools that work, right? The just the the tools and the skills and and devalues truth. And that pattern will then sort of infect you and show yeah. up in all kinds of other areas of life. Whereas a just business will hopefully do the opposite. Yeah. 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 I agree. And I'm I'm curious to know, see some of the details about this, especially how you I suspect you made a, some kind of transition over time because I know that you, as you said, you came across John's work uh, just a few years ago. So, and you've been managing your company for a very long time, like almost two decades. So, um, how did you how did you shift the culture if you had to shift it? Like, how did you go about implementing the scheme that you're describing now? Yeah, it's interesting. What's as you as you say that what's going on for me is that. It as you know, I skipped business school. I thought I was gonna be a youth pastor when I was a teenager. Like mm -hmm. I got into this because I just was trying to help people with their technology, and more and more people kept calling me for help until it was like, <laughs> oh, these are businesses, and I should probably form an LLC. And now I'm too busy and I need help. And like, so it was a very organic. I was not the like titan with a vision going and raising capital. And so it's grown or very organically. And what I would say mm -hmm. is that I've always. I don't know, always is a strong word. Um, what fills my soul, my being with meaning is seeing people genuinely flourishing around me and that my work and my presence brings joy and peace. And what I would say is that there have been seasons in the business, especially when you get out of like, for me, it was like past 10 team members started to get really tough for a while because I didn't know how to manage. I didn't have the systems. And then we got to like 40 and the wheels came off and I had to kind of like well, figure this out. And it was more this like, wait, this isn't what I actually value. And maybe I'm getting something that Inc. Magazine is telling me is really valuable, but it doesn't actually feel good. It's not actually bringing peace. This is like, I, this is not a good thing. And I want something of goodness. How do I get it in business? And what's happening when it's going wrong? And what's happening when it's going right? And how do we be more and more intentional? And I have this fear that if we don't name something, we can't articulate it, we're going to lose it. Like if we can't actually put language on what's happening, then we can't actually detect easily when we're losing it. And that's been more the pattern for me is this pattern mm -hmm. of this last year, we're not, it's not good for people, even though we're making money. What is this thing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Naming things. I think that's, that's really interesting because um, I've been trying to see like, what are some concrete ways to apply symbolic thinking to many things, including work. And one of the ideas that I, I can map this straight from, I think spiritual practices in different um, traditions is the idea of an examination of conscience. I see at the end of the day, you try to think about a few salient parts of your day and you try to see, okay, where was my art during those moments? Was I, I can reuse the same patterns I mentioned earlier. Was I too left-handed, too right-handed? Was mm -hmm. I too much in the heavens or too much on the earth? Was I too contemplative or too active? Um, I can, like sometimes, I can't do this always. Like when I'm doing stuff, like at a certain layer of reality, I can't always step back and contemplate. Um, but like, it seems to me that it's valuable sometimes to sort of step out of this, take the time mm -hmm. to name things, um, mm -hmm. and also to judge things. Like it's easier to 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 then see, okay, this was good, this was bad, and I suspect that over time doing this, then it feeds back down in a way where you can like have better framing for everyday situations, uh, and it's going to be easier to like have the right balance between the left and the right and between heaven and earth, between the active and the contemplative during anything you do during the work day. So this looks like what you're saying with naming things, uh, naming the, the patterns that are going well or going wrong. And like, you can't do this all the time. Uh, like it would be the same mm -hmm. as being always contemplative. You would be doing nothing. But if uh, like you stop and sometimes name things, it looks like it can then feed back down and main, like at least help faster things to grow in the direction that you want to. Does that seem to fit with the- uh, It does very much. Yeah, and I find that same, it's actually something I was just talking with 
leaders about yesterday that you know business has this way of pulling us down and in and into one mode and how we have to have very intentional habits in our work days and in our, our seasons and in our lives of coming back out and gaining that perspective. And I like your use of the model of symbolism of that, of saying, you know, what I, what I think we're trying to do is actually engage all of the parts of ourselves and and connect to our emotions and our broader perspective and to different time horizons to step back and say, now, how do I anchor in all of that and anchor in the transcendent and the sacred and the real, and then come clean my lens and then look at what's happening and feel it and spin it and evaluate it. And then to do that, I like to try to, the practices I try to, um, walk in that way. I try to do that in descending hierarchies of order, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll actually do a practice where I start and I meditate on like, all right, the the ultimate, whether you want to call it the kingdom of heaven, the transcendentals, like mm -hmm. what is really true. And then I'll meditate on my moment of death, like before death, how do I, the kind of courage, the kind of surrender, the kind of meaning, what I want to live on after me at that moment of death. And then come back to like 10 years from now, who do I want to be? What is the world that I want to see around me? And who do I want to have become staying in the being mode for this, right? Like mm -hmm. how, who, who, how do I feel? How do people around, what, what genuine goodness has been birthed in the world? And then I start to go to what are the big goals and the mechanics in order to do that? And then come down into my weekly schedule, my daily schedule and say, where am I missing? Like what's either in the wrong perspective? What do I have the wrong participatory relationship with? Yeah. What am I not spending enough time on in light of all of these things? Um, and do that in that descending order so that then my daily schedule can be informed by this ultimate view that goes up. Yeah. Does that map onto what you were saying? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's not like, like it's not the same kind of practice that I was outline outlining, but I see how that could work too. Um yeah, that's very good. And do you okay, another thing I wanted to jump back to that you said earlier about trying to foster, let's say the employee's own cultivation of wisdom outside of work. Um, yeah. I would imagine that as you get better at, at doing this yourself, at like stepping out of your work and then naming things and identifying when you're going in the right direction and when you're not, it probably becomes easier to, let's say, coach newer people to do the same kind of thing, like to like teach them how to distinguish between work and the pursuit of something higher. But I, yeah. I I'm interested to hear, I don't know if you can share examples, but I'd be curious to know like how this will take root in different people. Because as you said earlier, especially if different people in the company are encouraged to take different paths, as long as they like each pursue a spiritual path, uh, like it must be interesting to, like, it seems interesting to me to know how you can coach different people to do this, um, who will end up on different paths. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, what I would say is that's my question as well. And <laughs> the question that drives a lot. And I hope to keep trying and iterating and connecting with others and to to keep getting better at that because I don't think that we have that model by any means figured out. And I think that will be a, an endless process of unfolding. I think that, you know, some of what I've come to believe is that like first, it, it, like we can't take anyone and we haven't gone there, right? Like, like, yeah. Like ultimately, that's why even like I was saying that like it starts with like for me, my practices personally, like my own commitments, my own journey, my like the relationship of my career in serving something broader and the world that I want to see come into existence and that vision that I feel I feel called by. I, I use I a lot in that, but actually, I would say that the logos is drawing me to that. I my sensing is of that calling and that drawing that comes to us from another place. Mm -hmm. Um. And then, you know, so much of that's then with the presence is like to actually lead meetings in an embodied, connected way with like kindness and care and openness and genuine care for each other. You know, you can't, you can't do any of this if you don't actually care about people. And then if you don't actually create spaces of safety and care, and then, you know, and then we try to look for opportunities to just invite. So whether that's in personal conversations, one-on-ones, mm -hmm. in career coaching. Career coaching is an awesome place because when somebody wants to grow, the growth that, the things that hold us back in our careers are rarely just knowledge. They're rarely propositionals. You know, like you need to go get more knowledge in this thing. They're very typically character, perspective, yeah. wisdom, right? I'm sure you experienced that. Yeah. 
And so how do you help them with that? So like we have a process for career goal setting where it's like, well, before we talk about your career goals, like where are you going? What's important to you in life? And then what's your vision for a good life? And then how does work have its right relationship within that? And then once we've established those things, now how do we actually help with the right goals? And are those right work goals set within your perspective of your life overall? And what and like is this actually a time to push more at work or is it time to lean into something else? Because you're saying that family is really important, but you're not investing in your marriage at all. Like, And yeah. being really careful to not go where we're not invited and then create relationships with coaches and resources. And, and ultimately, I want to get I, that's what we want to develop a lot more of in coming years is more and more of those doors and invitations for people mm -hmm. Fascinating. without without getting in the confusing way of like you need to be able to come and work at main state not care about any of that do your job well and that's good enough and that's great like great this is not like you know you never want to be cultic you never want to start mixing like a spiritual and a business in a weird way like yeah yeah, yeah. go study we work and how they crashed and see how you know spiritualism run amok with capitalism can just be awful but like but like, no, to say, look, we're here to do good work. And along the process, we believe that work should be set within this broader frame. And let's invite to that journey in the broader frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very and, good. And people need it. I mean, there's so much burnout and stress and working from home has its own stresses and challenges. And like, you know, we're seeing it. I mean, people come in and it's just everyone's facing challenges. I mean, the meeting crisis is real. And so how can work be a part of actually being a redemptive agent of meeting people where they are, calling them and then providing them good work in community in a way that is actually restorative and pushes them on a path of transcendence instead of like mining their time for money only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting too. And be curious to know a, a little bit more about this because when you were in conversation with John, you said that you had noticed that... Um, things that have gotten worse during COVID. Um, yeah. And like you had also made some criticisms in general. Well, we talked a bit about this today already, but the fact that capitalism can feed negatively to some people's lives and it seems to have gotten worse with COVID or uh, at least that's what I think I heard you say. So I was just wondering like, what did you observe concretely in, in people through this crisis? Yeah, what I observed a few things and I'm so curious what your perspective is on this. I mean, one is that I think that work is one of the few places of community that pe most people have. It's one of the few institutions left as churches become, as religious organizations become less and less a part of people's lives, as the political mm -hmm. is becoming more afraid. It's, it's like people have work, entertainment, and politics. Like, is that like, yeah. like, like there's not a lot else. And so when you go from this, all of the fullness of relationships in an office together, to now I'm in my bedroom all day on my computer in one mode of being productive instead of all the modes that are called out by people's presence and the random interactions. Yeah. What I think that does is it, it takes away a pillar of support in someone's life. And so my observation, these are fairly small data points and personal observation is that but people who have strong families, communities, religious traditions, wisdom practices, what have you, they can work remotely and it's wonderful. It's like, it's more effective, productive. I can have less time into work and it can actually be a great thing. But if you don't have those things, it's like, what, you're a single person who now doesn't leave your apartment and is working on your laptop all day and then is playing video games all evening and then you fall in bed and wake up to do it again. Like, that's a really bad thing. And so I think that there's a segment of our population, broad, more broadly speaking, I, I propose this, that it has really impacted negatively in that way. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think I, I've heard something similar actually from some kind of polling that I heard Bishop Barron discuss on his uh, channel. He said that during COVID, like if you took most of the demographics, like did worse during COVID by some measures, like depressions and that kind of stuff. I think the like one of the only groups, if not the only group of people who did better during the pandemic were the religious people. Uh, hmm. It seems like people who, as you said, already had some kind of community mm -hmm. something that they could do where they would cultivate meaning then like working from home and like ev like many things being shut down didn't matter to them as much because they could still they could still pursue something higher and in a way it was even a sabbath for many of them like it forced people to take a break and like focus on what they could do and if mm -hmm. like you had more time to pray spend time with your family like this could be good for many people yes but uh, yes and and to contemplate the temporariness of all of this and of yeah. our lives and to be anchored in some greater reality like does that bring horror or you know a reframing and a reconnection and a reminding of something greater yeah and then yeah okay so that's interesting i, I hadn't thought about explaining it this way what you said with co like work making 
things worse for people during COVID in that um, like, it's like work was a crutch for many people. It's like one, mm-hmm. one, one of the big things that attached them to other groups of people and to some higher purposes. Uh, so then if, if works become a very like individual thing you do at home and you're always through screens, then like it's, it's not, not, maybe it's not even that you just lose what you had previously when working physically with people, but it can even maybe train you like in a bad direction where you're always just used to like being in this cycle that you mentioned earlier. Yes. Yeah. And I think I, I just want to say nuance quickly that mm-hmm. I think for a lot of people, the community of work is a really good thing. Like I think yeah. it should be good. I think we're made to work. I think that work is a beautiful and good thing that can often become a crutch, but that, yeah, what it shows when work we're doing we're working remotely is just the gaps in most lives in the other areas and how do we lean in and how do we invite more and more um to genuine community and then for me as an, as a business leader i try to think what's the right place of this because it's easy for an organization to sort of fill the vacant spaces in somebody's life and it's like well no yeah. we actually need to leave space for something else mainstay is not a religion and is never going to be one like we are not we don't want to fill the space of religion we also we restructured our whole nonprofit um our charitable giving um, approach recently because i'm like we're not a charity as well. Like there's this different place for charity and we need roles in a society. And so like it's mainstay should not be doing the work of a charity or giving in the way as a company. I have a lot of, um, a lot of thoughts and and concerns about the way that corporate philanthropy has been, has been going. I've been really trying to hash out and understand because we need to leave space for each other. There's a direct, there's right, correct hierarchies and roles in society that we need to leave. But within that work should be as strong and as awesome and as life-giving as possible within its own space. How does that land for you? Yeah. 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 That's very good. That makes sense. And uh, I'm very pleased with the way that you outlined your strategy to help people cultivate meaning at work, like starting from like people cultivating it independently of work, like all the business leaders, like encouraging them to pursue something that is higher than work. And then like making sure that capital um, is related to the company in a way that won't thwart its purposes. And then um, the the third layer, which was, can you remind me? I'm not sure like about the last two. Um, yeah. So then the model of the business, like what it's goods and services. Yeah, exactly. Doing something that is actually good in the world. Uh, and then the last one was uh, trying to like, encourage people to do this one-on-one, right? Well, yeah, well, actually the next there was like the jobs, the processes, systems, oh, yeah. like creating all of those mechanics to be as virtuous and reality connected as possible. And then putting all of that in and inviting people into that path of wisdom. Okay. Okay, that's good. That yeah. makes sense. It's good to it's good to hear that framework resonates with you because it's, you know, I'm always trying to refine it and get perspective and say, all right, how do we how do we do this better? And it's helpful to hear you articulate that. Yeah, that's very good. I found that very helpful. Really cool to know that you've thought about this uh, thoroughly before um, I before I spend time working on it. Uh, very very helpful. And I don't I don't really have any other questions. I feel like you've given me a lot to to think about. Um, so unless you have other questions for me, I think this would be a wrap. Yeah. Well, I would just love to, you know, as you continue to have discussions and think about this, I would love to be kept posted on your thinking. I mean, I, I would really love to see more and more of a community and a messaging growing around virtuous business and, and our jobs. Like we spend more waking hours working than doing any other activity. And yeah. for most of us. And it's a huge, silent, subtle influence in the way it shapes our values and what we assume to be normal. And we need to be getting the best philosophy on this. We need to be actually thinking critically in a deep connection to the business for those of us like you and me who are, who are doing this full time, right? We're working. And so I would love to be kept posted on anything and if I can be helpful in any way. Um, and then, of course, as you connect it to the symbolism, which you are much, um, you know, that's that's much more your thing than I'm not as um, well versed in that. I would love to hear more and more of your own connection to symbolism as you think about this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll keep you posted. I'd be happy to speak again too. Like uh, sometimes, as we both think through this, and uh, would be probably fruitful to keep like discussing it from time to time. Um, so yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I would enjoy we, that. We will keep in touch. Uh, maybe That's one great. thing I can recommend. Uh, I don't know if you've checked this book. I recommended it. Um, like I, I discussed it with a friend. Uh, uh, on my channel too, um, because it comes at it from a totally different perspective. And I'll have to think about how to bridge it exactly with what you just said. It's written for me, like totally 
like Christian point of view, it's more about people who are Christians and then work. Like how do you make your work participate in God's work? That's sort of the basic idea for the book. Um, Ordinary work, extraordinary grace. Should have named it because maybe like not everyone is going to be actually watching the feed. Uh, but yeah, like if uh, if ever you're looking, oh no, I I've seen your stack of books uh, that you posted. Uh, I don't know where I, I saw it. Uh, on oh, Twitter, nice. LinkedIn. I'm not sure, but yeah, like so. Uh, <laughs> I realize that I'm adding to your huge tower of books. Uh, but uh, if if you're looking for something else, um. I, I'd be curious to know how you bridge but that book too, because I quite liked it, but it seems like to be coming from such a different direction from what you just said. I can feel that there's something there, but uh, I, yeah. I'll have to think more about it. Well, I would, I would love that. I'm, I'll order that. And I, I like Scott. I've read some of Scott Hahn's other works, and so that that looks great. And yeah, maybe we can discuss because I have actually thought about this quite a bit from the theological perspective as well, and that would be a fun conversation to to have. I'd love to get your perspective on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, cool. So yeah, well. Uh, I'll be thinking about this and uh, we'll get in touch again. Great. Thanks, JP.